Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. Welcome to the beautiful woods of Western Pennsylvania. Right now I'm standing next to a tree that many people know and love. This is common pawpaw, which many people, including myself, simply refer to as pawpaw. This tree produces what I would consider to be one of the most popular fruits among foragers. These fruits are said to be the largest native edible fruits in North America. They ripen late summer through early fall, and they taste like a cross between a banana and a mango. Many people can't say enough good things about this tree, which is why it's kind of surprising to hear that there seems to be some kind of purported link between pawpaws and neurotoxicity. If you've never heard anything about this, you might be thinking to yourself, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. He's making this up. There's no way that a fruit that's been eaten for thousands of years on the North American continent is associated with neurotoxicity. Well, I'm not making this up. A quick online search will show you that people constantly talk about this link and tell other people to avoid eating pawpaws due to their neurotoxic effects. And perhaps more convincingly, a look through the scientific literature will show you that many researchers have studied and continue to study this link. I'm not gonna lie, this sounds a bit alarming, especially if we love to forage pawpaws, we love to hang out in pawpaw patches, we've been eating these fruits, we love to eat these fruits, maybe we've been eating these fruits for years, maybe even decades. Are we harming ourselves by doing this? Should we stop eating pawpaws because they're toxic? Are they really neurotoxic? What does the research actually say? Well, to get some answers, we have to understand something about the taxonomy of common pawpaw. Common pawpaw is taxonomically placed within a family known as the custard apple family or the ananaceae family. This family contains plants that mostly grow in tropical environments, which is why the presence of common pawpaw here in Eastern North American temperate ecosystems is kind of an anomaly. It seems kind of strange that this tropical looking plant with tropical tasting fruits grows here, but it does. Now the custard apple family contains other species whose fruits are widely eaten in many parts of the world. Fruits like cherimoya, custard apple, and soursop are eaten in places like the Caribbean, Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. And we might assume that these fruits, including pawpaw, are safe for consumption. After all, if lots of people are eating them in many parts of the world, they must be edible and safe to eat. Well, what if our assumptions aren't entirely correct? What if it turns out that there might actually be a risk associated with eating some of these fruits? Would you believe that? Well, let's dig into this topic a bit more. Let's go back to the late 1990s when neurologists in the French West Indies noticed something odd. They observed an unusually high frequency of atypical Parkinsonism that was resistant to standard Parkinson's disease treatments. The researchers published their findings in The Lancet and discussed the possible relationship between the high incidence of this kind of neurodegeneration and the consumption of fruits and herbal teas from members of the Ananaceae family. But this phenomenon wasn't confined to the French West Indies. Reports from New Caledonia and from London's Afro-Caribbean and Indian communities also suggested a link between consumption of these fruits and the incidence of atypical Parkinsonism. Following this epidemiological research, scientists started searching for a specific neurotoxin in these plants. They focused on a class of compounds known as acetogenins, which were already being studied for their anti-cancer properties. And the researchers identified a specific acetogenin known as ananacine as a probable culprit associated with neurodegeneration. Subsequent studies in the early 2000s began unraveling how this compound might cause neurological damage. And researchers soon started administering purified ananacine to rats. Researchers found that ananacine could cross the blood-brain barrier and cause brain lesions consistent with neurodegeneration. Now, up until the 2010s, most of the research on ananacine focused on other fruits from the custard apple family. Prior to that time, it wasn't clear whether or not the pawpaw fruit itself even contained that compound or whether or not consumption of this fruit 
could be associated with neurodegeneration? Well, researchers got more answers in 2012 when high concentrations of ananacine were detected in pawpaw fruits and shown to demonstrate neurotoxicity in lab cultured cells. A subsequent study found even higher concentrations of ananacine and other related neurotoxins in pawpaw fruits than previously reported. Following all of this, a case report in 2020 described an elderly man who developed a possible variant of a neurodegenerative disorder called progressive supernuclear palsy. The man's wife revealed that he had habitually consumed a large number of pawpaws for a decade. And a more recent study provided further evidence for the human epidemiological link showing that low but cumulative consumption of ananaceae fruits could worsen the severity of symptoms and cognitive deficits in people with Parkinsonism. That's a decent amount of research to read, to process, to wonder about, and to look more into. Of course, it seems pretty alarming. I mean, you have these groups of people with neurodegenerative diseases, and something they all have in common is that they consume fruits from the custard apple family. You have this compound, ananacine, that's been isolated from these fruits and shown to be neurotoxic in laboratory studies. And you have this fruit, pawpaw, that many people eat that has been shown to contain relatively high concentrations of this neurotoxin, ananacine. Let's think about what these studies are actually saying. And let's think about what kinds of conclusions we can draw based on the available research. What can we say for sure? Well, based on the available research, we can say that ananacine has been shown to be neurotoxic in laboratory and animal models. We can say that ananacine is present in a wide range of custard apple family fruits, including pawpaw, and that the levels in pawpaw have been shown to be higher than the levels found in other related fruits. And we can say that there is an epidemiological correlation between consumption of ananaceae plants and Parkinsonism in humans. But we can also say this, there is no definitive proof of a causal link between pawpaw consumption and neurodegenerative diseases in a large human population. All epidemiological studies linking neurodegeneration to ananaceae consumption involve fruits like soursop, sugar apple, and custard apple. Researchers even suggest that other factors, including pesticide exposure and genetics, could play important roles. It's also important to keep in mind that ananacine doesn't exist in isolation in nature. It only exists in isolation in a lab where researchers are able to test its effects on animals and cell cultures. No studies have ever tested the effects of ananacine on human beings, and some researchers even call into question the bioavailability of this compound once consumed. How much of it is actually absorbed? Studies in rats indicate that ananacine has low oral bioavailability and only a very small proportion of the administered dose reaches the actual brain tissue. How much of this compound is absorbed in humans? We don't know. And perhaps this is why, despite the prevalence of neurodegenerative disorders in a few populations that consume custard apple family fruits, worldwide, there's actually an apparent low prevalence of atypical Parkinsonism in populations usually relying on these plants. So there's a lot we don't know about the link between neurodegeneration and consumption of plants in the Ananaceae family, but there are some things we do know. We do know that the link between pawpaw consumption and neurodegeneration in humans is based on a chain of indirect evidence, including lab studies and extrapolation primarily from soursop. And in these epidemiological studies, we have to remember that in many cases, we're talking about long-term consumption of fruits and herbal teas, sometimes on a daily basis. And this is a big difference between soursop and pawpaw. In quite a few places in the world, soursop is available year round. It's a dietary staple and it's easy to consume consistently. Pawpaw is a bit different. If you know anything about pawpaw, you know that it largely resists commercialization. Compared to other fruits, pawpaw doesn't store well, it doesn't ship well, and it's only available fresh for a short window of time, usually late summer through early fall in Eastern North America. Because of this, traditionally, it would be difficult to overeat pawpaw, at least out of season. Yes, you might eat a bunch of fruits in September, maybe into October, 
But without any effective way to preserve the fruits long term, you're done eating pawpaw until next year, if a decent crop is even produced next year. Now, things are changing today. More and more people are learning about pawpaw. Big festivals are held every year to celebrate it. Lots of people are growing it. And people are finding good ways to preserve the fruit and eat it year round, increasing the frequency of consumption. Could this be a problem if we extrapolate what we learned from the soursop studies? Maybe it's difficult to say for sure because no one knows for sure. Papa is a different fruit. Yes, ananacine is found in papa, but different cultivars of papa contain different levels of ananacine. And it might be interesting to see if moving forward, papa growers create more and more cultivars that contain lower concentrations of this compound. This also brings up the point that we don't even know what the levels of ananacine actually are in all wild papa fruits. Are the levels of ananacine in Pennsylvania pawpaws, for example, the same as those found in South Carolina pawpaws? Are the levels different in the skin compared to the fruit pulp? Are they different in underripe fruit compared to ripe fruit? We're not entirely sure, but I'd guess the levels do vary. It's also important to remember that pawpaws have been a food source for a really long time, for indigenous people, for early American settlers, for modern humans without a documented history of serious widespread health issues. Yes, there was that one report back in 2020 of a pawpaw eater who developed a possible variant of progressive supernuclear palsy, but keep in mind, no direct cause was actually identified. Yes, there are people today who don't tolerate pawpaws. They get sick, they get headaches, nausea, some kind of gastrointestinal distress, but you could say the same thing for almost any food. People get sick eating pecans, wheat, Chicken of the woods. Considering everything we discussed in this video, I think there are two important points to keep in mind. First, it's important to respect the seasons, especially as it relates to diet. We're so used to eating any food we want, any time of the year, in any quantity that we want, that we forget this is kind of a new thing. It hasn't always been like this. And you have to wonder if there are consequences associated with disrespecting the seasonality of particular foods. And second, we've all heard this before, but it might be the key to healthy pawpaw consumption. Moderation is key. Perhaps pawpaws don't commercialize well, they don't store well, they don't ship well, and they have strong phytochemical profiles because they are meant to be enjoyed for a short window of time in moderation. I'm going to continue eating pawpaws the way I've always eaten them. Fresh, ripe, late summer through early fall, a few here, a few there, nothing too excessive, with respect, gratitude, and appreciation for all the lessons that a place like this can teach us, especially as it relates to diet and health. Thank you so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. Head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter so that we could stay in touch and check out my online courses on ecology, tree identification, and mushroom foraging. Thank you again for watching. I will see you on the next video.